stuff perfectly correlated. One. The next number, correlation between general electric and city, uh, that's 54%. Okay? Uh, next number, Home Depot, correlation between city and Home Depot, 36% and so on. Right? Um, you have this thing going, you have this for all of them. Why, why do you think this one is blank? What should this number be? The correlation between GE and city. Right. 53%. These all, the reason these are blank is because off diagonal elements are exactly the same. The correlation between city and GE is the same as saying correlation between GE and city. So this number and this number should be exactly the same. The correlation between city and Home Depot is the same as saying correlation between Home Depot and city. So that number should be the same. So essentially what you can do is you can take these numbers below the one, below the one copy it, and click after the one on the right. In the, so first column would go into the first row, second column would go into the second row. And you take special values and again transpose. So you get the code, so you, so you got this numbers here. You do have the names. First row and first column should be exactly same. Second row and second column should be exactly same. Third row and the third column should be exactly same and so on for both correlations and covariance because correlation between A, B is same as saying correlation between B and A, okay? That's why the, the off diagonals will be uh, not blank here. So I'm going to, so before I copy and paste everything, is there any questions so far? Okay, so, so you go into data analysis, okay? You want to select correlation because I want Control shift and right that way you select everything up to the point where you have a blank cell. Okay? But that is a shortcut. But you can just do it by, by doing it individually, it's not going to cost you more time. And then you select the whole data set going forward down, right? You go select up to the end of the data, and that's it. And then <coughs> okay. And you select uh, labels in first row because I had names, names of the names of the companies in the first row, and and let it pop up uh, in a new worksheet, and it gives you the full correlation matrix. Okay. So, so that's what I have here. Is there? And then what all I'm doing is copy pasting these numbers in the in the in the first column onto the first row because correlation between G E and C When you flip I or J in correlation, it doesn't change correlation. Okay, so that's why that's why you can copy paste the blank cell. Okay. The second column should be in the second row. Third column. So always select the part below the one. Okay, not above the one. Third column. Copy this. Paste it in the in the third row. If you want to select the whole one, it's not. Fourth, uh, fourth column, paste it in the, in the fourth row. Uh, and I'm doing paste special transpose. Okay. So this gives me the full correlation matrix. That correlation goes into this, the part which says correlation matrix. In your Excel, it says the same thing. Just copy paste it here. You take special values. This is my correlation matrix. So it gives me the correlation between all of these securities. Um, so again, just to have a sense of what these numbers mean. Uh, what it means is that the correlation between GE and Citigroup is 54%. While the correlation between, let's, say, let's take the negative number, correlation between Intel and Home Depot is only negative 9%. Okay? 
Which one would give you higher levels if you make more benefit? Negative value. So that's basically, that's why we need these numbers, okay? All right, so now, again, going back to this, I want, really what I want to be able to do is I want to be able to compute the portfolio risk. <coughs> In order to compute the portfolio variance, I need to be able to compute the individual covariances. That's this. In order to do that, I want the correlation. I have the correlation now. I want the individual standard deviations. I have those standard deviations. I computed them before. And those are these numbers. So I have everything that I need to do to compute each of these covariances. Again, covariance is going to be exactly the same. It's going to be an 8 by 8 matrix, just like the correlation. The only thing is correlation times the individual standard deviations. Okay? So think about this, this, this think about the, the column as I, think about the row as J. Okay? So think about this as I. So city group, covariance between city group and city group is this cell. Covariance between city group and GE is this cell. Covariance between city group and Home Depot is this cell, and so on. So that's what I'm doing here. Okay. So again, covariance is correlation with this number. Okay. The corresponding number in the correlation matrix cell. So when I'm looking at city, city, just pick the correlation between city and city on the top. Correlation. What is the next thing that I need to do? Multiply by. Standard deviation of city, which is here. Multiply by standard deviation of city, which is just both of I and J are city. Okay? So that's the number. So this is the first one. This is the covariance between city and city, which is variance. Okay? So this is the variance of city. Uh, and you do the next thing, you, you do the next one. So I'm going to do some of them, and then I'm going to basically expand to all of them in one go. So let's see. Let's take another one. Let's take the covariance between Intel and Home Depot, this particular cell. So tell me what do I need to do? Correlation between Intel and City, which is this number, okay? This one. Multiply by what? Standard deviation of Intel. Standard deviation of Home Depot. That's it. This is the covariance between covariance between Intel and Home Depot. Okay? I could do the same thing for all the other cells. Is there any questions before I do that? And I'm going to do it in a quick way. Okay, so I'm going to do it in one go in one minute. So that's why I'm asking you, is there any questions? Yeah. Can you tell me how you got the covariance? First number? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I'm going to pick a third cell. Instead of doing the same cell, I'm going to just pick a third cell, let's say, this one is going to be the same form, uh, same application. So I want to compute covariance between this and this. Okay. So look at the formula. It's the correlation, which is between these two, times the, the standard deviation of let's say city, times the standard deviation of the second term word. Okay. Uh, so the correlation is right up here. We already computed that. This number is here. So you just pick that number, which is this one, this cell. So that's the correlation cell, so that's this first component. Multiply by standard deviation of city, we computed it here. Okay? Multiply by standard deviation of, of Merck, which is this, this one. Okay? So that's the covariance between these two companies. Okay? Is there any questions? Okay, really speaking, I can do this in one go. I'm testing the same thing in the column, in a column and a row. Uh, and then uh, I want this matrix to move around because both in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the character dimension as well as the numbers direction. So I'm not going to touch that, uh, touch that number. What I don't want is when I'm looking at, uh, when, I'm, when I'm going down here, I want the number to change, but I don't want the character to change. So I'm going to put the dollar sign in front of the character. And then I'm going to do the same thing here. In this case, I don't. When I move to the right, I want the I want the characters to change.
change, but I don't want the, the number to change when it moves down, so I'm going to put the, a dollar sign in front of the number, and that, that should better work, okay? Um, so this is my entire Coco virus matrix. But if you don't get that, try to learn it. If you don't get it, just do it individually for all the 64 cases. Um, it will cost you some time. The way you want to check it, whether you, the way you want to make sure uh, uh, to check whether you did it right or not, what do you, what would you do to check whether your covariances are right or not? What could you do? That is true. Aside from that, there's one more thing that you could do to check, uh, which is octagonal elements should be safe. So, sitting with GE, it's 468. GE, this is a huge to be changed. So, this number should match up, this number should match up, this number should match up, which means that first row should be same as first column, second row should be same as second column, and third, third row should be same as third column, and so on. Okay? Covariances, that should hold as well, just like code by code. Yeah? Oh, so, we go through the shortcut to fill it yeah. all one more time? So what I did is, uh, so I took this, I took these, uh, um, I took these codes, so my standard deviations are available in, to me in, 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 in a column format. I also made them available to me in a, in a row format, okay? So the same numbers are here, the same numbers are here, okay? That's the first thing that I did. And then, then what I did is, uh, what I really want to do is go IJ, sigma I, sigma J. So let's say I is C, city group, J is city group. So, so the correlation, uh, whenever, I'm, I draw, whenever I drag something down, the numbers start changing. When I, whenever I drag something to the right, the characters start, start changing, okay? That's the key in Excel. When you, whenever you drag something down, numbers are changing. Drag something to the right, characters are changing. Uh, if you want to fix something, you put dollar sign on that. That's, that's how you make it, okay? But for correlation, whenever I drag something, I want numbers to change, as well as when I drag something to the right, I want the, 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 the numbers to change, or the characters to change. So, so the first term I have B16, uh, I, I don't want to fix anything, because when I drag B, when I, when I drag down, I want to keep the next number. So that means I want the 16 to change. And when I drag to the right, I want to pick the next column, but that means that I want to change, I want to also allow B to change, so I don't want to fix anything here, okay? But in this column, in this column, okay, I want to always use the standard deviation of, standard deviation of city group, which means I want to fix that, okay? And how do I fix that? I fix, I put D dollar four, because in D dollar four, is the standard deviation of city group. Even if I move down, I would, it wouldn't change. Uh, and in this row, this row contains the standard deviation of, of city as well. So whenever I drag, drag to the right, I want to make sure that the standard deviation of city is used in each of these rows, in each of these cells. So I'm fixing the dollar on the C, okay? So when I drag, this is going to stay as of it. When I go down, this four is going to change, so this one, the next one would be C5, the next one would be C6, the next one would be C7, and so on. But when I go to the right, the C is going to be fixed. So even here, it's going to be C4, C5, C6, and so on. And when I drag this down, D is going to stay as, the four is going to stay as of it. When I go to the right, D is going to change to E, D, uh, and then E is going to change to F here, and so on. Because that's what I want. I want. I want to pick the next, next, next column. Okay. So all I'm doing is is making shortcuts to compute the whole matrix in one row. Yeah. <coughs> The, the shortcuts again. The shortcut is 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 not it's not something that I'm uh, I'm going to spend a lot of time on. 
What I really want to understand, want you to understand is can you compute this for every single cell? Let me ask you this question. Because short quiz is something that you will get over over time when you spend more time in the cell. Okay? And that's not something that I'm going to spend a lot of time on because I'm and I need to be able to compute this, uh, finish this in, in one hour for two minutes. Uh, so what I really care about is can you compute this two variance for every single cell? Do you know what this number means? That's all I care about at the moment. Okay, because shortcuts, if I spend too much time on shortcuts, then it would become a class on Excel, not a class on a Okay. Uh, so for the moment, I'm not going to concentrate on shortcuts. If you want to uh, get the shortcuts, you can stop by, but not in class. Uh, some of you might know this is short code, some of you might not know this one. But do you get how to compute covariance if you if someone gave you correlation and individual standard deviation? Can you apply this to all 64 cells without the short code? That's the main question that I want to ask you. Can you answer that to if, if you answer yes to that, I can move forward. That's it. That's all I have to ask right now. Okay. Okay. So that's the key at the moment. But again, if you have time, I'll, I'll come back to that short part. Okay. So the next thing that I want to do now, so now I have everything. Um, I have the covariances, and I have the expected returns. So I have the ability to compute the expected returns of the portfolio if I know the weights, and I have the ability to compute the risk of the portfolio if I know the weights. And weights is my choice here. So what I'm going to say, so the first thing is, our objective is these again. Again, going back to this, our objective is to minimize the portfolio risk by changing the weights, which is our choice variable, with some condition. Okay? Uh, any optimizer, any numerical optimizer that you would use ever, you have to tell it a starting point. It doesn't know the starting point itself. Okay? So I'm going to start with, uh, with equal weights. Or you can choose something else. So you can choose, uh, let's say, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.15, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, and so on. Let's say minus 0 0.15, uh, 0 0.15, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.75. Yeah, it's anything that you can, you can plug in anything you like. Uh, uh, as long as it sums to one, you're fine. Uh, it's just, uh, you have to give it a starting point. So you can assume any starting point for the weight, that's fine. Uh, we, but once we have this starting point, uh, because that's the programming part, because when I'm going to allow, when I'm going to run my optimizer, I'm going to tell my optimizer to change this, and as a result, everything is automatically going to change. I'm programming that part. Uh, so once I have these weights, so given these weights, so this is my starting point again, okay? I'm assuming the, this as, a, as my starting point to find my optimal weights, okay? Because my numerical optimizer requires me to tell you, tell it where, I, where it has to start. It does not know where to start, okay? So I'm telling it, okay, let's start here. You can pick anything. You can take equal weights, you can take uh, whatever you dream of, as long as it sums to one, it's fine. So given that, what I need to, so given these weights, let's program uh, the portfolio variance and let's program the portfolio expected return. Once we have that, we are ready to run our optimizer uh, by to change these weights. Okay. So the, uh, the, in order to compute the, the portfolio variance, the quantity that we need to compute is this. Okay, it's exactly similar to the quantity we have the, the weights, individual weights times the covariance. Okay, so the quantity is pretty similar. Uh, this, it's kind of like think about this as weight, think about this as covariance. Uh, similar quantity that I want to compute. Uh, I have these. Where, where is that? Where, where is the covariance in my, my Excel? Okay, it's this one. So I have all of the 8 by 8 covariances. So I have all 
the 16 covariances that I need uh, to compute this portfolio variance. Uh, and I have, to, I have a dual cell weight, which is up here, uh, to compute, uh, sure compute the portfolio like variance. So I, again, I have 64 terms because my summation goes from 1 to 8, 1 to 8. In your case, you would have 81 terms because your summation would go from 1 to 9, 1 to 9. Um, so what is the first term? Uh, so let me first tell you what I did here. These are my weights. So think about this as a weight of city group, weight of E, weight of uh, Home Depot, and so on. It's the same form that, that I have here. And in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the row as well, I have put the same weights. But when you do that, make sure you refer to the cell, okay? Make sure this is A equal to 41. Do not write that as, as a number. Do not copy paste it, okay? Make sure you have, have so this is a weight of city group. Make sure you write the weight in the, in the row. You write it as equal to this number. And then the same goes here, equal to A42, do not just write 0.1, because the reason is because I, when this changes, I want this to change as well, okay? And if you don't do that, what's going to happen is your opti you, because you can only tell your optimizer to change this. When you, when you tell your optimizer to change this, you want this to change as well, otherwise your, your code is incorrect, okay? So make sure you do that. So this would be A43. Uh, A44 and so on up to A48, okay? So the last one is the weight of Walmart, okay? Now, first quantity that I want to compute to compute this portfolio variance is the weight of the, so first one, first, uh, first uh, cell, what is this? What is this? What do I need to do? So that, that formula, okay? So this one is, this one is city, this one is city. Weight of city times weight of city times the covariance of between city and city, which is this one. Okay. Um, the next quantity would be okay. Tell me the next one. The weight of city times the weight of the times the covariance between city and city. Okay. Do the same. Covariance between city and home depot. Okay. Weight of I times the weight of J times the covariance between I and J. So I is city, J is home depot. That's what this is. Okay. Is there any questions about this? All I'm doing is computing the individual terms that I need to compute the portfolio variance. Okay. Is there any questions? Because I'm going to again compute this in one minute. <laughs> so tell me if there's any questions. So I don't, so when I'm, when I'm looking at this column, I don't want the character to move when I move to the right. So that's why I'm putting this a dollar sign in, in front of when I'm looking at this row, I don't want the number to move when I move down, so that's why I'm going to put the dollar sign in front of the number, and then, and then the last thing is my, these things I want to move on both sides, character as well as number, so I'm not going to touch that, just press enter, pull it to the right, and you're done. Okay, so you have a full, full covariance here. Full, all of the 64 terms that you need, able to compute this, okay? Once you have that, sum all of those 64 terms, you get your, uh, get your value, okay? So in my, in my example, each of the column is summed individually. Don't, don't use the weights, okay? When you sum it, sum from weights and below, below the weights, okay? Don't use the weights. So I have summed the, all of the 
all of the columns individually and then sum all of them together. But the alternative would be, uh, so ignore this thought, let's say we remove this. The alternative would be, uh, so portfolio variance is the sum of all of these quantities, right? Which is, uh, which is all, which is, which is this entire eight by eight matrix. Okay, so remember I'm not using the weights. I'm only starting from below the weights and to the right of the weights. So this entire eight by eight matrix sum it. That is my that is my portfolio variance. If I want to put compute portfolio standard deviation, what do I need to do? Square root of that. And that's my portfolio standard deviation. And then portfolio mean. Portfolio mean. What do I need to do to compute portfolio mean? Or expected return. Base times the expected return of each of the security and then sum it. Okay? So that's this. Base times the expected return of each of the security and sum it. Did we compute the expected return of each of the securities? Yes, we did, right? We computed the mean. That's right here. All we have to do is multiply these numbers by the corresponding base and sum it. That would give us a portfolio of expected return. Um, so I'm just going to copy this, this number in, in a place where it makes my life easier. <laughs> and then I'm going to multiply it by the corresponding weights. You could do that, uh, that's not a problem in your Excel, okay? Uh, all I care about is as long as you understand, you can move around in the Excel based on your preferences. Okay? Um, and then, uh, so what I did is, is this last column is uh, this last column in my Excel is is a Is, is the product of the, the weight times the corresponding expected return. So one of the terms, right? The first term in my summation, the second term in my summation, and so on. All the eight terms, uh, that's the entire column. Okay. All the eight terms, uh, this entire column is the, is, the, is the each and every eight terms. Then if I want to compute the expected return of the portfolio, I just sum all of them. Because I already computed the uh, so now what I, essentially by doing all of this, what you have done is you program your expected return of the portfolio as a function of weights. You program the portfolio standard deviation, which is the measure of risk for the portfolio, as a function of weights. Now we are ready to do this. Okay? Because we want to really do this. We want to change the portfolio risk. We want to minimize the portfolio risk by changing the weights, the choice variable that we have with some constraints that we have. Um, so in my, in my example, uh, in, your, in the Excel that I gave you, you also have some, a column like this. These are just the different levels of returns for which you want to minimize risk, okay? So you, what I'm going to do is I'm going to minimize risk for this level of return. It would give me a set of weights or a reserve. You're going to copy paste that here. And you're also going to copy paste the corresponding risk uh, for this level of return. You're going to do that for the next level of return and so on. Uh, the Excel that I uploaded for this example, okay, um, the answers that appear in that Excel, uh, that are for, for a scenario where I don't allow short sales. When I say I don't allow short sales, what does it mean? Cannot have late less than zero. Negative weights are not allowed. That's that's why I did. So that's the answer that appears in your in your in, in the one that is uploaded online. Okay. Uh, so how do you do that? Um, uh, you go to the solver. Okay. This is the value <coughs> that you have. Okay. This is the optimizer. This is the numerical optimizer. You know, that you have. Okay. Go to solver. What is the quantity that I want to optimize over? What is it that 
I need to do in this experiment? What is it that I want to minimize or maximize in this experiment? Minimize standard deviation of the portfolio. So where did we program standard deviation of the portfolio? Yeah, in this cell. So what you're going to do is your set objective part is going to be the cell where you have your portfolio standard deviation, which is this one. So, so what you're doing is you're minimizing D52. D52 is my portfolio standard deviation. I want to minimize that. What is my choice? What is my choice variable? <coughs> what can I choose? Wait. So, so minimize the risk by changing variable cells. Okay, by changing variable cells. Which is, where is my weight? A41. A41 to A48. Okay? By changing these weights. Now do you see why I made you comp uh, refer to this cell? Do you really see that? Okay. The reason is because when I'm going to click solve, these numbers are going to change. But when these numbers change, I want these numbers to be exactly the same as it is. So that's why I want the I want to defer to these cells, not copy paste that. Okay? So do not copy paste it, otherwise it will, it will not work for you. Um, what are the constraints that I have in this example? I want to, what is the first constraint that you have on weights? Equal to one. They have to be equal to one. So I have actually already programmed cells. In your solver, you can only refer to a cell. Okay? You cannot program formula. So I have already programmed the sum of weights in 49. So this is just equal to sum of these. I want this to be exactly equal to 1. Otherwise, it's not, a, it's not a correct solution. So you click on Add, and you select the cell where you program the sum of weights. In this case, it's this one. Okay. And this e less or equal to choose equal to, because I want this to be exactly equal to 1, and set this equal to 1. So this constraint means that the sum of weights have to be exactly equal to 1. You cannot put the formula here, otherwise you could have just said sum of this. But we can't do that in Excel, so we have to program that in a cell and then refer to the cell. Okay, so okay. And the next constraint that I want to add is, uh, is that the mean return should be exactly equal to 20. Okay, so choose the... Uh, so where is the cell where I have my expected return of the portfolio? 53. Okay. I want that to be exactly equal to 20 because I'm going to do that for different levels. 20, 23, 26, 28, okay, and so on. And then for each of those levels, I would have the, the risk of the portfolio and I would have the weights. So I want this to be exactly equal to 20. So set it equal to 20. In your case, these numbers go from 1 to 26. Uh, I'm not doing the constraint where I say make uh, if you want to make the weights to be uh, non-negative, just click on this and your weights would be uh, zero or positive number. They would not be negative. Uh, if you have all the older Excel, uh, then you have to put those constraints individually, which means that you have to say this should be greater than or equal to zero, this should be greater than or equal to zero, and so on. Any constraint that you want, of course, you can only refer to a cell. Okay, that's it. Once you have done that, click on this thing which says solve. It will say something like solver found a solution, all constraints and optimality conditions are satisfied. Uh, if that's the case for you, press OK. Uh, it ends up with a, a portfolio. So, what, so you can see that the portfolio expected return is exactly equal to 20. What this number means is that for, for if you want these eight risky assets to give you exactly 20% return, then the best portfolio would be the one which has a risk of 21.18. So that's this. And these are the weights that you need to put on these eight risky assets to get this exactly 20% return and 21.18%. Uh, so what, what would you do with this? You would copy this thing and you pay special values When you run the solver again, the number is going to change. So you want to keep this, and you also want to keep the weights. So you take all of these weights, and you take special weights values. You do that for the next level. So this is, so what, what is this? This is the first point on this curve, okay, or one of the points.
points on this curve. I'm going to do that for the next level. So what do I need to do? I need to change this. Go back to solver. What is it that I would change now to do it for the next level? The mean should be equal to 23. So go to that cell which where you program the mean. B53, 23. Click on change. have a full, uh, full set of results. So you have to do this over and over again. So you go back again. So I'm going to do it one more time, okay? And let me know if you have questions. Yes, sorry, guys. Well, you know that that's not going to be the whole thing. Instead of just changing it. minimize, so that's why min, not max, okay? Uh, what is my choice variable? My choice variable is the base. But by changing variable cell, it's going to be the part where you have the base, this one. Select all the base, uh, subject to some constraint. I want the constraint. This is absolutely true for any single exercise that you, any exercise has to sum to 1. I have already programmed the sum of base in cell 49. So select that cell. Set it equal to exactly 1 because it needs to be exactly equal to 1. The other one that I need to add is that the portfolio mean should be the next level, 26. So select the cell that I have programmed the portfolio mean or the expected return of the portfolio. And I want that to be exactly equal to 26, set it equal to 26, press OK. Uh, I don't have any other constraint. In your exercise, in your Excel exercise, there are two exercises where, that, where you have additional constraints. If you do have additional constraints, you have to program them. Okay? So in your Excel exercise, one is where you have short sale constraints, which means you can't have you can't short sale. All you have to do is make sure all weights are greater or equal to zero. Each and every individual weight is greater than or equal to that's a short term constraint exam. In the next question, you have something where you have to have one asset to have at least 10% weight. Another thing is that the sum of the weights of two assets should be at least 20%. So you have to program those things. But since I don't have anything, I just click on solve, I get a new result, take the portfolio standard deviation. So this is the this is the weight that I need to push to get exactly 26% with the lowest possible risk. Okay? Again, there could be more than one possible sets of weights that would give you 26%. But this is the weight that gives you the lowest possible risk. That's why it's the best possible. That's why that portfolio opportunity set is the best possible opportunity set for each of these levels of returns, okay? So I could take this, take special values, okay? And that's that. So do you do that? You do that for all of the levels. I have it in my Excel, so I'm going to open the one which is done. So for all of the levels, you do it. Again, this one is the one which is done with uh, short sale constraints, which means the weights have to be positive or greater than equal to zero. That's why you see that the weights, none of the weights in any of the cells here are negative. You see all of them are either zero uh, or, or positive. Okay? Because there is no negative weight in this block here because this exercise was done with short sale constraints. The one which I have loaded online in this example is done with short sale constraints. That's why you see zero or positive numbers here. In the one which we just did, you see negative numbers. 
ambulance short sales are allowed. Okay? That's the first exercise that you have to do. That's why I'm doing it here. The second one in your, in your example, you have to do something like this, where you actually impose short sales in ambulance. You do that, you have these two columns. These are the two columns that we need to cross this, right? What is the x-axis? Risk, y-axis, expected return. And you have the, uh, the harvest here. Uh, your x-axis is this, your y-axis is this. If you want, generally I flip it and then it makes my life easier, so that's not so nice to do. So this, this is my, this is my standard deviation, this is my x-axis, this is my y-axis. You take this whole thing, insert, chart, or go into this packet, and select this. Okay, this is your portfolio opportunity set uh, with uh, <coughs> these eight risky assets. You're going to do this three times. Uh, this is the graph, actual graph of the full thing. You're going to do this three times. Uh, that's why um, you're going to have three of these graphs. In this Excel, so it's again, expect a return on the y-axis, portfolio risk on the x-axis, this is your uh, this is, this is your portfolio opportunity set efficient frontier. Let's say this is the minimum value, so efficient frontier is everything above that. Would you ever choose this <coughs> portfolio? No, because you can choose this. Okay. Uh, same thing. And uh, what what else do you see? You see that all of the individual assets, so these these dots, uh, are the individual assets. So this is the this is one of the individual assets. This is another one. So for example, this is J and J, which is Johnson and Johnson. This is the risk of Johnson and Johnson. This is the mean of Johnson and Johnson. What do you see? Every single asset is below the portfolio, uh, below the efficient frontier, or potentially on the efficient frontier. <coughs> so your efficient frontier has to be all of them. Otherwise, you have an error. Okay. Um, in some constraints it may not, but in a no constraint scenario it would for sure beat the, beat the, beat the individual, all of the individual assets, okay? So this is exactly what you're going to do. Of course, um, you can go further and actually find the optimal risky portfolio. Uh, if I want to find the optimal risky portfolio, I need to give you the risk-free rate. Let's say the risk-free rate is 5% in this example, then because how do you find the best portfolio? If I gave you 10 portfolios and I told you find the best possible among these 10 portfolios, what would you do? Sharp ratio. So you would find the sharp ratio of all of those 10 portfolios, pick the one with the largest sharp ratio. So really speaking, what you do need to do to find the optimal risky portfolio is maximize sharp ratio. Okay. So if the risk-free rate is 5%, um, then let's say risk-free rate Five percent. Then all I need to do is program sharp ratio. So sharp ratio is the expected return. What is sharp ratio? Expected return on the portfolio minus the risk free rate divided by the risk. Okay. The expected return on the portfolio is this cell minus the risk free rate is this cell divided by the portfolio risk, which is this. Uh, if you want to find the best possible portfolio with the largest chart ratio, go into solver. Uh, instead of max minimizing the risk, you maximize the chart ratio. The cell, the set objective cell to be the one where you program chart ratio. You set it equal to max instead of min, because you want to maximize the ratio. Uh, you still choose the weights, you still make uh, the choice variable you have is the weights, so by changing the weights, you don't have this return level anymore, the only constraint that you would have is that weight shifts up to one, there's no other constraint. Click on solve, this is the largest sharp ratio that you could get, and this is actually your optimal risky portfolio. The portfolio that gives you, in this case, the optimal risky portfolio would give you this risk of 19.2, the expected return of 40.9. These are the ways that you need to get to get that optimal risk portfolio. So I found that this is the, in my example, this is the tangency portfolio. This reserve is the tangency portfolio. I don't
to make you do this uh, in your in your question, but if you want to play around with it, it's just one more, essentially, really speaking, one more step that you need to do. Because once you do all of these things, 